Chamber talks about that there's a lot of uh, need for empirical research, you know, that, uh, uh, like some of the previous speakers have said, that, you know, there's a lot of anecdotes, and we, we all know teachers say, well, I kind of skipped that bit, or, you know, I'm not too sure about the phonetics, or, I, 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 you know, I have a funny accent, so I don't go into pronunciation very much, and uh, they seem to pick it up as we go along. And, but the, so the lack of research is there, so I felt like, uh, again, others that maybe I can fill in that gap a little bit looking at some actual research. So when it comes to contrastive analysis and interference from the L1, that's, that's a very useful book that a lot of you will know about from your training, Learner English, which kind of gives a profile of each uh, culture and nationality really and gives you uh, difficulties that they may have in not only pronunciation but in grammar and uh, lexis and so on. So it's, it's a very useful one, Learner English by uh, Swan and Smith. And uh, it, it's a kind of a go-to resource if you want to look at, at that. At that. Um, if Michelle has a nice word. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just, it's just, uh, I suppose, uh, it doesn't show too well on the slide. Uh, if you look at the error on itself, say the error in pronunciation, and then this, what's written that you can't read there is error correction. So um, I, I do think that the error correction needs to go on. Unlike, we'd say, what, what may, maybe is in the literature, maybe what you've learned before about interference, I think there is an, a more in-depth look at what's underneath that's causing the error and causing the interference from L1. And there's a succession of things. We don't have to go into them in, in, any, in any detail at this stage, but just, just you'll recognize sorry, some of those, uh, whether it's the affect filter, even how you feel about pronunciation, your whole emotional response to it, your language acquisition device, as in Chomsky, the original acquisition of your first language, um, auditory processing skills, your motor articulation skills, uh, noticing skills. So, there's all that cluster of stuff that, that, that's different to a kind of a, a surface level behaviorist approach to pronunciation. So I'm, I'm in that way, we, we could call that psycholinguistic. That's, that's, my, that's my way of, of looking at it, that we go, we go beneath the surface. So just as an example, I took uh, from Learner English the systems that Spanish students. So I took a small case study just of seven Spanish students. And we had a look at, and you'll be familiar with this maybe, we know that the uh, unshaded areas here, these sounds here like z, sh, z, j, they don't exist in Castilian Spanish, in, in Peninsular Spanish. So we can expect that they'll have some difficulty uh, with those sounds. And we kind of know that. So I, I took uh, only, in my research, I just looked at a case study looking at the consonants here and these particular ones. So we only need about six phonetic symbols to, to explain those. And they were intermediate to advanced speakers of English because I'm talking about sort of the meta-language of pronunciation. So I, I wouldn't be doing this with beginners. Um, so, and we know that uh, we can expect from our own experience that if... Spanish student doesn't have z for eyes, they're going to substitute their closest version of that, which would be ice. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we are aware of that. So um, I targeted very specific features, just for the sake of the study to make it manageable, I targeted very specific features and kind of grouped them together as, you know, that uh, insertion of that e eh vowel before an SP cluster, say an S cluster of consonants. Um, a study, a student, a school, and, and so on, where, where in Spanish you're not allowed to start straight into the cluster. You have to put in a vowel. And just a consonant cluster reduction, we know that Spanish students have difficulty with words like explain, I explain, uh, because even though consonant clusters occur in Spanish, they don't occur as frequently as we have them in English, and they can find it quite difficult. The j, y substitution can be difficult as well. And then I grouped all these ones where these uh, consonants can be missing. I just call that sibilant confusion, where those sibilants can become interchanged. So you have a word like casual, and if they don't have that z sound, they may say casual, or casual, even. Um, so these can add up. Uh, there can be kind of leakage, we we'll say, to the supersegmental level, to that level of say word stress and intonation patterns. Say, for example, if I, if, if your Spanish student is saying I am studying a Spanish in the school, and suddenly the rhythm starts to uh, drift. And there's research that says that uh, we actually start identifying words for intelligibility as as listeners. We we actually pay more attention to the syllable structure 
than to the, uh, to the sounds. And that when we're searching and we don't get the word, we don't immediately search for alternative sounds, we, we search for similar syllabic structures mm -hmm. in, in our searching. So uh, that's kind of interesting how uh, even the segmental level can, can uh, as I say, leak into the supersegmental and cause intelligibility problems. So very quickly, um, this was, a, in my master's I had done this myself, where I sort of, you know, targeted these features and just taught it myself. My study at the PhD level is to look at, say, take a novice teacher, and we've, we took a, a teacher who was uh, teaching and learning on the MA course, and uh, she taught six classes with her own methods that she, has, that she had learned just in general, and then she did another six weeks of using uh, the methodology that I had that given her based on phonological systems knowledge, so I'll just go through it very quickly. Basically, that idea that there are two phonological systems, there's the Spanish one and there's the Irish and English one, uh, and that they're different, and here are the features. So you ask intermediate and upper intermediate, advanced level of students, so you're giving them cognitive knowledge about, oh, you're missing these sounds in your system. Uh, these are the sounds you'd be inclined to substitute. So giving them that, that basic information. Some basic information about oral motor knowledge, how the sounds are made in the, you know, the, the lip position, some very basic knowledge. Phonetic symbols, as I say, so maybe just six phonetic symbols that would be needed over the six weeks. Phonetic contrast, so again, giving the meaningful um, minimal pairs that show that we're not just being picky, that there are reasons why shin and chin are actually completely different words. Phonological perceptual exercise. So again, we're all under the iceberg at this stage. We're looking at, can they target, when somebody else says the sounds, can they target, uh, oh yeah, I know which one you're talking about. So when you give them minimal pairs and we say the words, can they point them out? So some of us have done this already. And then finally, the practice of production skills uh, in communicative language teaching uh, uh, formats, I suppose. Uh, so I did a kind of a, it doesn't matter too much about methodology, just we, if we look at the six weeks here, so there was a six week period where she did her own normal natural pronunciation teaching, and then there was a six week period with, with the same group of seven Spanish students where she did my recommended model, if you like, and she only got intervention herself on how to do it halfway through and when she had done the first six classes. So we were looking then at, you know, what sort of levels of improvement had occurred in that six weeks versus this six weeks. And we looked at, uh, we did an assessment at the beginning and at the end of each period. So we have two kind of uh, baseline measurements. We have a baseline measurement starting off here, and we have a baseline measurement, if you like, starting off here, or, which is equivalent to what they ended at there. And then we did another assessment here, looking at the phoneme level. We're not talking about rate of speech, just phoneme level. So just very quickly, we, 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 won't need, we don't need to go into the detail. The blue represents the level of improvement in terms of error reduction that happened in the first six weeks. The orange represents the level of improvement in the second six weeks, and then you have a total. So we're looking to hope that the orange section is going to be significantly better. And it is, it is significantly better. As a class group, we have it all, we'd say, just in, in the class, performance was like this, where you have a reduction of, say, 10% in the blue period, the control period, and 54% reduction in the second period. So we're the same students in the same period of time with the same input, the same classes. It's only one class a week for six weeks. So it's a very minimal input. Um, uh, but because we targeted uh, processes and we targeted, as, it, as, it, as, it, as, it, as we say, what's under the surface, we, we got pretty good results. So it's just maybe something to keep in mind um, for your own teaching that this old, older idea of interference that, you know, it is worse, and particularly now we have, sometimes we have monocultural groups that we have an awful lot of Portuguese speakers now with Brazil groups. Uh, it might be worth having a look again at what were the patterns from their own L1. Can we look at some patterns like what Michelle was talking about as well? Um, it's it, it, why well, have the luxury of six model, you know, monocultural, so that makes it much easier. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose I leave the final word uh, from a student where she had a problem with the word dangerous, which obviously one of the target sounds, and uh, I let you read that as I'm talking. Um, they have very vivid uh, experiences, and we have phonetic and phonological knowledge about L1 and L2 systems that I think we need to think about giving to them. Not just repeat and say or say and repeat, but actually giving them cognitive 
uh, knowledge about why the pronunciation might need uh, particular work. It obviously takes it away from the personal then, you're into the uh, linguistic background that you're from, rather than it's not that you have pronunciation problems, these are the difficulties of Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, whatever it might be. And I think it gives you more freedom uh, to talk about it. So hopefully you've had a chance. Um, and for me, it's nice. That's where unite. We like to be <laughs> to give them a nice experience at the end of the day. Uh, and that was a very authentic quote from one of the students that was on the.